Hello again. Here we are with Vox Historicus, uh, continuing our two-part segment of public opinion and political action. We begin by taking a look at our recent overview. In this part of the segment, we're going to go ahead and explain how polls are conducted and what can be learned from them about American public opinion. We're also going to assess the influence of political ideology on Americans' political thinking and behavior. We're going to continue by classifying forms of political participation into two broad groups. And lastly, we're going to analyze how public opinion about the scope of government guides political behavior. Well then, without further ado, let's get started. Now keep this in mind, as you watch the video today, there are going to be questions you need to keep in mind. So I do want you to make sure that you get this in your notes. You're going to need them. You may be assessed over this particular material uh, sometime during the day uh, as we're conducting lessons in the classroom. So some of the questions I want you to keep an eye on are, what are, what are polls and how they've been conducted? What are the various types? That's what I want you to ask. answer me. What are the various types of polls that have been taken? The various types. Okay? Various types. Now, I also want you to go ahead and take a look at explaining the technique of random digit dialing. I want you to also list some of the criticisms of public po uh, opinion polling. And lastly, I want you to compare and contrast between liberalism and conservatism. The liberals and conservatives. What are there differences? What are the similarities? Again, if you don't know what compare and contrast is, it's differences, differences and similarities. Now, according to their general beliefs and typical demographic characteristics. Now, keep in mind, when I say demographic, I'm talking about ages. I'm talking about um, religion. I'm talking about gender. You know, we're talking about many different demographics here, including the newest one, sexual orientation. We'll go ahead and take a look at that one, too. There's so many, guys. Uh, work background, are they blue collar, white collar? Um, what else can I think of? Um, there, there's just uh, ethnicity, race, so many different demographics. Now, who are the conservatives and who are the liberals? That's the question. Who are the liberals and who are the conservatives? So make sure as you watch the video, interact with the video by answering these questions that I've given you to guide you as you watch. Again, I cannot emphasize how important it is for you to complete this assignment. Now, measuring public opinion and political information. How are polls conducted? How polls are conducted? What Americans believe and believe they know is public opinion. The distribution of people's beliefs about politics and policy issues. Rarely a single public opinion with so many people in such diversity of populations. There are also many opinions. Public opinion is one of the products of political learning throughout our lifetime. Now, public opinion polling was first developed by George Gallup in 1932. He is the renowned pollster when it comes to American politics. Of course, he's passed away now, but however, his legacy continues to be Gallup polls. And you'll continuously hear about Gallup polls throughout our political discussion this semester. You'll also hear about Roper and uh, New York Times and USA Today's polls and AP polls. As you can see, I have a little cartoon here to the side. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at it for just a second and see if we can interpret what's going on. Be ready to answer any type of uh, discussion we might have over it in class. Now we continue by asking ourselves, what are the major aspects of effective polling? Well, of course, polls rely on sample of the population, which is a relatively small proportion of the people who are chosen as representatives of the whole to measure the public opinion. A sample of about 1,500 to 2,000 people can be representative of the universe or the larger group whose opinion is being measured of potential voters. Now, such a sample size can lead to a sampling error or a margin of error anywhere from a plus 3% to a minus 3%. Now, the key to the accuracy of opinion polls is random sampling, which, of course, operates on the principle that everyone should have an equal probability of being selected. Now, there's also a certain amount of risk in inaccuracy involved, known as the sampling error. However, due to sophisticated technology, which is now available for measuring public opinion, such as computer and telephone technology, have made surveying less expensive and more commonplace. 
Most polling is now done on the telephone, with samples selected through random digit dialing in which calls are placed to telephone numbers within randomly chosen exchanges. Some of us may have even been uh, victim to some of these sample pollings. Now, in this era of cell phones, many pollsters are starting to worry whether this methodology will continue to work much longer. My question to you is, do you believe that it will continue being a prosperous methodology, or do you think that new technologies and new technologies available today will hamper such sampling? As you can see here, I've illustrated public opinion polls. Now, you can see here, public opinion polls these days are done mostly over the telephone. As you can see, as the interviewers, most of them who are young people and frequently college students, sit in front of a computer terminal and read the questions that appear on the screen to randomly chosen individuals they have reached on the phone. Then they enter the appropriate coded response directly into the computer base. Such efficient procedures make it possible for analysis to get survey results very quickly. The role of polls in American democracy. Now, supporters of polling believe it is a tool for democracy by which policymakers can keep in touch with changing opinions on the issues. That is key. Critics of polling think it makes politicians more concerned with following than leading and actually may thus discourage bold leadership. Of course, what sounds better to a politician? Doing his own thing or trying to do what his constituency wants him to do. Of course, recent research by Jacobs and Shapiro argues that the common perception of politicians pandering to the results of public opinion polls may actually be mistaken. Rather than using polls to identify centrist approaches that will have the broadest appeal, Jacobs and Shapiro have actually argued that elites use them to formulate strategies that enable them to avoid compromising on what they want to do. Some of the issues, of course, positive or negative, with polling include polls can weaken democracy, distorting the election process. Polls are often accused of creating a bandwagon effect in which voters may support a candidate only because they see the others are doing so. Emphasis on polls results, of course, sometimes have drowned out the issues of recent presidential campaigns. The election day exit poll is probably the most criticized type of poll. Now, let me explain exit, election day exit poll. With the election day exit polling, basically what it is is that as people are going into the voting, into the voting uh, place, such as maybe your local elementary school, and they cast their vote for their officials, as they're leaving the voting place, the voting poll place, as they're leaving... Um, and it has to be by a certain measure of distance away from the voting polls, they are then asked, hey, would you mind sharing who you voted for? And some voters will give their answer. Now, some, of course, won't. This is known as exit polling. Perhaps the most persuasive, pervasive criticism of polling is that pollsters can get pretty much the results they want by altering the wording of the question. Of course, anybody can get what they want. All they have to do is word it correctly. Although the bias in such questions may be easy to detect, and the ethical problem is that the organization may not report how the survey questions were worded. Now, polls reveal a lot about Americans. Polls reveal about American politician, political information. Polls reveal that the average American has a lower level of political knowledge than citizens of other countries at similar levels of development. What does that say about our society here in America? Part of the reason is that American political system works as well as it does is that people do know what basic values they want to uphold, even when they do not have information on policy questions or decision makers. Now, the increased level of education and the increased availability of information over the last four decades has actually scarcely raised public knowledge about po politics. However, public cynicism and the mistrust of government undermines the ability of government to address pressing social problems. And therefore, we, of course, achieve the decline of trust in government for the last 50 years. In the late 1950s and the early 1960s, nearly three-quarters of Americans said that they trusted the government in Washington to do the right thing, always and mostly. 
However, by the late 1960s, researchers started to see a precipitous drop in trust in government. Beginning with the Vietnam War and Watergate, these two events shook people's confidence in the federal government. The economic troubles of the Carter years and the Iran hostage crisis helped continue the slide. And by 1980, only one quarter of the public thought that the government could be trusted most of the time or always. And since then, trust in government has occasionally risen for a while, but the only time a majority said they could trust the government most of the time was in 2002 after the events of September 11th. So my question to you is that, well, it's not a question. It's more of an observation. As you can see, two events that were actually, I would say that Vietnam and Watergate, how do they compare to September 11th? And why do they have separate results when it comes to trusting in government? Here's a nice little graph, figure 6.3, the decline of trust in government from 1958 to 2010. We could just take a moment and look over the graph and how it shows how people have responded over time to the following questions. How much of the time do you think you can trust the government in Washington? You know, when this question was written in 1958, survey researchers couldn't imagine that anyone would respond, never. So the traditional wording of the trust in government omits that this option. However, in 08, 2% of respondents volunteered that they never trusted the government. Some pollsters have actually experimented with including the option of never and have found that as much as 10% of their sample will choose it. Polling, of course, is a great measure of what the public opinion is. But the basis for such an opinion comes down to what America values and what values are divided into a political ideological uh, discussion as to who are the liberals and conservatives. Now, as we look at both liberals and conservatives, Americans do pick ideological label of conservative over liberal. In 2008, 36% of Americans were conservatives and 38% were moderates and just 26 were liberals. Some groups are more liberal than others and want to see government do more. This includes people under the age of 30, minorities, and women. Now, groups with political clout tend to be more conservative than groups whose members have often been shut out from the halls of political power. When it comes to gender and political ideology, women are not a minority group, making up about 54% of the population. Yes, women, that's true. You do outnumber men by approximately 4 to 5%, but they have nevertheless, nevertheless been politically and economically disadvantaged. Now, compared to men, women are more likely to support spending on social services and to oppose the higher levels of military spending, which conservatives typically advocate. This ideological difference between men and women has led to the gender gap, which of course refers to the regular pattern by which women are more likely to support Democratic candidates who are liberal than they are to Republican candidates that are conservative. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the key to the gender gap and the differencing between men and women in political ideology and their decisions on politics. Now, sir... How can I tell the difference between a liberal from a conservative? Well, here in Table 6.1, in an attempt to clarify liberal and conservative, those labels that are so often thrown around are some of the political views likely to be taken by liberals and conservatives. Now, this table, to be sure, is oversimplified, but it is the best graph that I could provide to you so you'll understand what the difference is. Do people think in ideological terms? Well, ideological thinking is not widespread in American public, nor are people necessarily consistent in their attitudes. The authors of the classic study, The American Voter, by Angus Campbell, first looked carefully at the ideological sophistication of the American electorate in the 1950s. And what they did, what Campbell did, was that they divided the public into four groups according to the ideological sophistication, beginning with ideologues, only 12% connect their opinions and beliefs with broad policy positions taken by parties and candidates. Then, of course, you have your group benefit voters, which are about 42% of the American population. 
which think politics mainly by the groups that they like or dislike. Of course, you have the nature of the time voters, who, of course, the handle on politics, which are 24% of the population, limited to whether the times seem good or bad to them. And last, you have the no-issue content voter. 22% of the voters were devoid of any illogical or issue content in their political evaluations. Most simply voted routinely for a party or judged their candidates by their personalities. Now, if the same methods are used to update the analysis of the American voter through the 1980s, one can find that sometimes an increase in the proportion of ideological thinking, but the overall picture pretty much looks the same. Labeling of positions. For the most part, people. The terms liberal and conservative are just not as important as they are for the political elite, such as politicians, activists, journalists, and the like. I mean, honestly, how often do you hear people out on the street just declaring themselves liberal and conservatives and really having such a such a heavy weight to the label itself and carrying it upon themselves, aside from politicians, activists, and, and so forth. Although some point to gate rights as an example of an issue that polarizes the country into a cultural war. And you've seen that cultural war play out in the last 10 years, specifically on the issues of gay rights. Polling data indicates a gradually increasing acceptance of gays and leb lesbians among liberals, moderates, and conservatives alike. Here's an article about attitude towards gays and lesbians and the effects on liberal moderation and conservatives. If you could just pause the video here and read the article, I would dearly uh, uh, respect that. Please, if you could do that. <clears throat> Here's another article. How younger and older Americans compare on the issues. Again, if you could just maybe pause the video again and read through the article and answer the questions for discussion. When it comes to political participation, well, what it encompasses is the many activities used by citizens to influence the selection of political leaders over the policies they pursue. Americans have many avenues of political participation to open. Now, the United States has actually a participatory political cultural, but only 55% of Americans voted in 2004 presidential election, 39 turned 39% turned out to the 2002 midterm elections, and the numbers get even smaller for state and local elections. You have to understand that these numbers, what they reflect, what they truly reflect is that of all the Western democracies in the world, we actually have the lowest voter turnout. Political science is generally distinguished between two broad types of participation. You have your conventional participation and your unconventional. Voting, of course, is the most widely known way of participating in politics. It is the most common form of participation, to be honest with you. Conventional participation, widely accepted modes of influencing government. Voting in elections, which is, again, I, I reiterate, this is the most common form. Working in campaigns or running for office, contacting elected officials, ringing doorbells for a petition, or running for office. These are all, of course, conventional methods of participation. However, you have your unconventional. Protest as participation. Protest is a form of political participation designed to achieve policy change through dramatic and unconventional tactics. And we've seen that play out throughout history. And protests today are more often orchestrated to provide general, to provide sorry, television cameras with vivid images. Throughout American history, individuals and groups have sometimes used civil disobedience, of course, consciously breaking a law that they think is unjust. Illustrated in different eras by people like Henry David Thoreau in the 1840s, and of course, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1950s and 60s. Of course, all, um, I know that MLK was definitely inspired by the protests that uh, Gandhi took upon himself in India during the uh, India-English clash. Now, nonviolent civil disobedience was one of the most effective techniques of the civil rights movement in the American South. Reverend King's letter from a Birmingham jail in a classic defense of civil disobedience. Political participation can also be violent, as in some of the Vietnam War protests of the 1960s are shown to be. 
The right of political protest is constitutionally protected as an integral part of freedom of speech in the United States. And of course, you find that in Amendment 1. Although the war in Iraq did not engender the kind of mass protest seen during the Vietnam War, there have nevertheless been some major anti-war demonstrations, such as this one in Washington during 2007. Nonviolent civil disobedience was one of the most effective techniques of the civil rights movement in the American South. Young African Americans sat at white-only stables, lunch counters to protest segregation. Photos such as this drew national attention to the injustice of racial discrimination. Continuously, class has provided some type of inequality within also participation. In the U.S., participation is class bias activity. Class bias activity means that citizens of higher socioeconomic status participate more than any other group. Of course, minorities are below average in terms of participation. The participation differences between these groups and the national average has actually been declining. When blacks, Hispanics, and whites of equal incomes and educations are compared, it is minorities who participate more in politics. Who gets what in politics depends on who participates. I've told you time and time again since we studied the Laszlo model. If you want something done, you must be part of the political situation of the political world, of the political arena, of the political scene. Now, my question to you is, why is participation a class bias activity? Why is it that socioeconomic status creates a gap in participation by those who are rich and those who are poor? Political participation by family income. The graph shows, of course, by income status that the percentage of the adult population who said they participated in various forms of political activity during the year. So is it? Could income have an effect on participation. Well, let's analyze the graph for a minute, pause the video, and let's see if that's true. Public attitudes towards the scope of government. Many people have no opinion about the scope of government. Actually, public opinion is inconsistent, with which may lead to policy gridlock. People just don't know what they want. They don't know how to get it, or they just don't care. A lack of efficacy. The question of government power is a complex one but it is one of the key controversies in American politics today. Public opinions on different aspects of the same issue do not always hold together well. While more people today think the government is too big rather than too small, a plurality has consistently called for spending on programs like education, health care, aid to big cities, protecting the environment, and fighting crime. But of course, as we know, these programs will cost money. And in a time of national debt, are these the right directions to take? Many political scientists have actually looked at these contradictory findings and concluded that Americans are ideological conservatives but operational liberals. And when it comes to democracy, public opinion, and political action, actually Americans select leaders in democratic elections. Polls reveal that Americans know little about the candidates' issues. What does that make about the decision that they're making? People vote more for performance than policy. Americans often take for granted the opportunity to replace our leaders at the next election. And perhaps the best indicator of how well socialized Americans to democracy is the protest typically is aimed at getting the attention of government, not at overthrowing it. Even if they are only voting according to the nature of the times, voters are clearly being heard, which holds elected officials accountable for every single one of their actions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's two-part lecture. Uh, this, of course, concludes uh, our public opinion and political uh, action uh, chapter. And uh, we'll be moving on now to nominations and campaigns in the next segment. Thank you.